Selma lives in Malaga, Spain, and is a writer and a painter. I, Anika, live in the Bay Area, California, and I too am a writer. We grew up in Pakistan, and we've been educators all our lives, but we have also lived and worked around the world. Our blog, The Lissom Magical Stories from Around the World, captures some of those memories as they relate to literature and language. And as we tell these stories, we'd like to share some with you. So let's begin with how Selma found her voice. I pretend I'm doing schoolwork. Pretend this argument isn't happening. Why do they fight, shout? I don't look up. Why make the situation worse? In these years, most of my conversations are silent. I live in a secret world where I can miraculously rewind sentences and fix anything that doesn't come out right the first time. It doesn't help that we move so often. I've changed five schools in ten years. By tenth grade, I've stopped speaking out loud The Catholic school I attend is perfect for children like me. The nuns expect us to work in silence, and I am their star pupil. At 25, I move to California and start working on a master's degree in linguistics. On the morning of my first presentation, I sit at the back, hoping that there won't be enough time for all of us to speak. I try to concentrate on my notes on index cards. I can't. The professor's muffled voice makes its way through the blood pounding in my ears. And now, Selma will present her paper on code switching in a multilingual conversation. I stand there, staring at my cards, but can't make out the words. So I look up and start speaking. I know my face is red. It feels hot. I swallow to steady my voice, but I can still hear it tremble. Why would anyone be interested in how and why speakers of Urdu, English and Punjabi switch between the three languages in an informal conversation? Why didn't I choose a topic more relevant to American culture? My presentation comes to an end, and the sound of clapping goes on longer than I expect. My professor is a French woman, and many of my class fellows are Spanish speakers. Of course they understand code switching. I almost cry with relief. For more than three decades, I've consciously focused on growing my voice. I no longer feel paralyzed when I cannot find the right thing to say, the words that would please my audience. Today my voice is clear, not loud, just precise and strong. Selma, we grew up together. We've shared so many stories together. And, um, but there's some stories which are unique to the life that you've lived and the travels um, and your travels. So would you like to share with the viewers a story that is unique to you and that you have taken and then made it your own and, and the unique way in which you made it your own? Yes, um, there, there is one particular one. And this is when I was living in Madrid and living a post-work life where I just traveled. I got on the train, I got on the bus, I just traveled. And one of my visits was to a little uh, city of Avila, just outside Madrid. And that's where I discovered St. Teresa of Avila. Now, she is a feminist, but at the same time, she is humble and practical and all the things that I I would aspire to be and she also lived in a very patriarchal world 
where women did not have the, the rights that they have now in Spain. So yeah, her story was um, something that I could relate to. And as I read her, I thought, here's this woman who wrote centuries ago in a language which I didn't, well, and now I can speak Spanish, but in, early I didn't, in, in Spanish. And as she was writing, she probably never thought that a woman of Muslim heritage of, from Pakistan, a country which didn't even exist at the time, would find peace in, in her words. And that is the, the power of words. They may not be relevant at the moment that you write them or speak them, but it could be hundreds of years later in another corner of the world, somebody might pick up your words and think, ah, I feel as if this has been written for me. So they, there's some particular elements in what said Teresa writes some images um, and how they've inspired you and you've taken them on um, in your art. Do you want to share a bit about what those elements are and how they're represented, particularly when we chose the, um, you know, the main uh, image of the Lissom, our blog? Um, what were the elements that you, you felt that is important, that, that those elements are important to share as for storytellers and for them to be inspired by those uh, elements? Well, one of the images that stayed with me is that of a reptile representing our weaknesses. And I thought to myself, from a Sufi perspective, uh, our strengths and weaknesses are all part of the same thing it's all one. And so I used that reptile in the painting that we use on our blog to listen, and, and the garden and the water and the man-made tiles to show that it, it, it's a Sufi thought using the images of St. Teresa. And basically it is every part of the world is integral to our existence, whether it's man-made, whether it's, it's a, a weakness, whether it's a strength, whether it's the source of life, water. So I, I use these images from writing and poetry to incorporate into my art and convey my thoughts. What are some of the stories that are close to your heart or your mind or both? The ones that I have read or the ones I have written? Well, the ones that you've read and may have inspired you to write or? Well, you know that when I was, I want to say 18, but I don't remember the exact age I was. The one that I really inspired me was The Bride by Babsi Sidwa. That was my kind of turning point in my life of uh, a Desi writer writing from close to home and a woman who was writing from close to home. And I read The Bride and I remember um, our aunt who is featuring in uh, Abda Popo, who we're featuring in our uh, memoirs as well. She went to school with uh, Babsi Sidwa and um, she mentioned how she'd had conversations with her and how you know highly respected she was even as a student. And so that story, the, the story of the bride of this young woman who um, goes to Lahore and then she, she's going to be forced to get married and then all the travails, you know, everything that happens after that. And of course those memories of, uh, I, I don't think they're her memories, but the memories of her father of a place that he grew up in up north. Um, that was a story that resonated with me. And more recently, I've been seeking out um, particularly female writers um, only because I, I find a peace uh, a lot of times in looking at the world from the eyes um, of writers like um, Elena Ferrante, you and I both love her work. Um, because the stories are just stories of human beings trying to live their basic lives. And um, 
and all her books. We, we, we've really been engaged with them and we read, and then there's Orhan Pamuk, of course, and, and our own kind of love affair with Istanbul and Turkey and all culture like, like the, the, that what's going on in Pakistan. Anyway, everyone is in love with Istanbul culture, uh, but, but the way Orhan Pamuk shows Istanbul and the depth of it, you know. The, so those are some storytellers who I read um, and you and I have both read them together and discussed the stories to, you know, and, and we'll be writing about them and have been writing about them on the blog. But yes, you were going to ask a follow-up question. Yes, so which aspect of these writers and their writings um, uh, influence the way you write? Talk a bit about your own writing. I like the connections within the connections within the connections. I don't really care for neat stories. By when I say neat, where all the ends are tied neatly and um, the package is given to the reader. I like loose ends um, because that is how life is. And I know sometimes people say we read to escape life, um, but, I, and I, I do the same thing. I do read to escape life. Um, but I also enjoy seeing life in a, in a magnified and sometimes a more stylized way. Um, and it allows me to look at life in a more magnified and stylized way and then appreciate it a lot more. And so when we've had a trip together um, in, you know, when we've traveled together and we've gone around places which are not necessarily all organized the way, you know, tourists expect them to be, uh, we both appreciated the um, kind of the, the minor, the minor faults, so to speak, um, how people prefer art as opposed to photography uh, or, you know, the, that human element in life. Um, so I like uh, stories which are not necessarily neatly tied up. And that is why in my novel, Wild Boar in the Cane Field, I haven't really tied up all the loose ends. Um, I've left it to, for, to my reader's imagination to see what happens to Tara and um, her daughter and the people around her and what do they make of life. Um, so yeah, that, those are the elements. I reminded myself to breathe deeply before my insides took control of my body again. My back pain became less intense I focused on the brightest star in the sky. Malik had called me his star. Was I that one? Or maybe the smaller one next to it, the one that kept disappearing. I needed to get back up and find Malik. I imagined him on the charpai that we shared at night. It was a cool night, but he would have stayed outside. He would be listening to these hyenas and wondering why they were howling. I could hear the dogs now too. Where were they? What had happened? What was causing such a commotion? I pulled myself off the stump and began walking toward the canal. A few fireflies were still dancing on the water. How long would they live? They died when their light went out. My backache returned. This time it became intense, heavy. It was as if my baby were pushing against my stomach with her feet and leaning heavily against my back and my breathing became shallow again and the dry heaving returned. I needed to call out for Malik, for anyone to come. My voice would travel at this time of night light, but I could not bring myself to call out. I was now crossing the canal and could hear the hyenas and they were calling from the cane fields. What had happened? Why would they not stop calling? My fear began reaching for my heart. It was now feasting on my insides and it began to suffocate me. I covered my mouth with my dupatta to keep my breath from escaping and I needed to move on and not let this fear paralyze me. My eyes strained as I peered into the darkness in front of me. Shadows moved even though the night was still. I tripped over a rock and steadied myself. 
I was halfway between Safiya's house and our hovel. Would anyone even find me before it was too late? A thin mist descended on the canal, and from the fields a rat-like animal scuttled in front of me and jumped into the water. What could have terrified it so to make it take its own life by drowning? What was hiding low in the fields? Was it someone crouching, concealing itself from the hyenas? Or was there something, something more ominous? Thank you.